session for today. Uh, so we'll hear again from uh, Fred McIntosh and uh, take it away. Okay. So um, let's. I, I want to go back to this uh, naive, uh, affine model of uh, the shear modulus of a network and. Uh, So we'll ultimately identify this with an um, affine, um, as an affine modulus. Now, um, I have been not really making too much of a distinction between Young's moduli and shear moduli. You'll know for most materials, they differ by not very much. Um, and I guess I'll maybe start to be a little bit more careful and use an E here for the, for the Young's modulus. Uh, and I argued that uh, naively you'd expect uh, a, if you dilute a system characterized by a volume fraction of what's left, the simplest possible approach to the mechanics of the full system is to just say that the shear modulus is diluted by that factor. So that's basically assuming uh, an isotropic arrangement of what's left. So literally if you were to take like a um, two-dimensional system drill a bunch of holes in it in some random fashion, and assume that what remains has to deform purely affinely, you'd get essentially that result. Um, but uh, I also want to start thinking about a different way of characterizing the concentration of fibers, and ultimately connect up with this, before proceeding to show you how these thermal fluctuations that I mentioned can actually explain uh, a little bit better those lower moduli uh, that I said you get below this value. So another measure of concentration, which turns out to be useful, I'll call rho, it's the length per volume. OK, so literally take all the fiber in your system, connect one up end to end, calculate the full length, and divide by the volume of the sample you put that stuff in, OK? Not mentioning anything about the lengths of the fibers. Uh, this is just a, uh, a measure of the length per volume. And if you think about it, it relates uh, rather nicely to this uh, mesh size that I was mentioning before. Um, because uh, what would it mean to measure the length per volume in, and I should probably indicate this as a three-dimensional cube. One has to be a little careful about what looks like just 2D and what applies to 3D. So make that a 3D uh, roughly cube. Of course, you shouldn't imagine an ordered system, not a perfect lattice. It's some disordered meshwork. But the typical spacing between filaments is about C, the mesh size. And so to measure this length per volume, just imagine you put one po polymer through that, and then what's, the, what's that length per volume? Well, it's essentially C divided by C cubed, i.e. C to the minus 2. So the square of the inverse spacing of polymer basically measures that length per volume, apart from a prefactor, which might depend on precise arrangement, if it's an ordered structure, et cetera. Yes? So do we assume that the, uh, that the polymer has no uh, radius? Yeah, so I'm all, I, there, there is a radius. I'm getting to that. That'll relate to the volume. So in other words, if I now take that length and turn it into, rather than an idealized line, give it some finite width, then I get volume. So now the volume fraction is essentially, um, well, uh, this guy has a cross-sectional area of pi a squared, let's say, if a is the radius of that. So then I just multiply that pi a squared times this length per volume, and I get a volume fraction, because this length times that volume gives me the volume of fiber. Out of a total volume, gives that. 
So the volume fraction is nothing more than um, essentially a squared rho. Uh, and so um, let's think of another way of getting the modulus in terms of the fiber. So um, the shear modulus is obtained by m measuring the stress, shear stress, as I deform a system by a given um, simple shear uh, of strain, say, gamma. Uh, and then I take the ratio of that stress to strain. Um, but uh, basically, if I take this yellow fiber here and I shear this sample, what I do is, with this orientation here, I elongate that fiber, not necessarily its actual arc length, but I separate its points of, let's say, contact to something else, um, by an amount that depends on the strain, the orientation, um, and the length of that. So the elongation is essentially, apart from an orientational factor, is essentially the, the macroscopic strain applied times the length of that um, fiber. And so if it has a, uh, if it's made out of a material with a Young's modulus E, it has a 1D uh, Young's modulus. You could call it a stretching modulus. Um, and the shear modulus could be obtained by just taking that and multiplying it by the length per volume. Oops, uh, yeah, OK. This is obviously an um, order of magnitude estimate. Um, because again, um, energy is going to go like the square of the strain. The uh, elastic energy of stretching this guy uh, is going to go like the um, one-dimensional strain applied to that squared times its modulus, 1D modulus. Um, and this row factor takes into account how much of that length I have available to strain, OK? It's just combining factors. And so notice that this 1D Young's modulus mu should just be essentially pi A squared times the Young's modulus of the material I make it out of. Right? I just have more of it with a larger cross section. And so just putting these factors together, uh, noting this, and this uh, factor here is also a squared over c squared. This combination here is just volume fraction. So indeed, this is a simple way to see how you get a simple linear dependence on volume fraction. Um, one of the few uh, precise results you can actually, well, not few, you can get many results precisely, but um, basically if you want a, the full calculation in this particular case, there's a factor of 1 over 15 that just accounts for a bunch of trigonometric terms of different orientation of fibers, uh, but indeed you'd get this. OK. Now, I should refer to this as a mechanical modulus, so I'll put a little m on it, because, or elastic, you could say, because it's just taking the elastic material and stretching it. OK, I have said nothing about thermal fluctuations. Yes? Oh, um, yeah, so interestingly, that doesn't appear here. And the reason it doesn't appear here is the affine assumption says that every little bit of my system is deformed in exactly the same way. Now, of course, the only way in which a fiber segment is deformed has to do with the fact that it's connected to other stuff that's deforming, right? So this fiber here is not somehow magically connected to the boundary of my sample and getting strain. So you're absolutely right that the strain in detail depends on the constraints and how it's connected to the rest of the network. That'll come up momentarily. But this affine approximation for the deformation is a highly idealized one, not necessarily realized. Do you allow for a sliding 
Oh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a purely elastic point of view. Everything is, is, the connectivity remains absolutely constant. There's no sliding of fibers against each other by, let's say, a moving crosslink, et cetera. So I'm sticking entirely in the elastic regime. There's some very interesting things that happen when you take into account that kind of dynamics. Uh, transient cross-linking is one of the more interesting and subtle ones, and it's very relevant biologically. Um, you also could imagine plastic deformations where I actually somehow deform the fibers. You might have seen those images of collagen fibers. They're actually bundles. Those bundles can actually have some internal rearrangements. Just leaving all that out. Interesting potential stuff, but beyond the scope of this simple starting point. OK, so um, however, remember by looking at these um, cloud of fluctuations of endpoints, where let's say I constrain a polymer here and allow it to fluctuate, I was interested in these longitudinal range of fluctuations I call delta L squared, uh, which were uh, essentially um, L cubed over LP by a simple scaling arg uh, squared. Sorry, that was the square that I mentioned before. The longitudinal motion is quadratic in the transverse motion. And um, I claim that that should be um, uh, also uh, KT divided by some sort of effective or thermal, maybe is a better term, spring constant. Thermal spring constant is not quite the same as a Young's, or spring constant is not the same as a Young's modulus because a Young's modulus tells me what tension I have to apply to get a certain strain. The longer it is, the less the strain is for a given displacement. So the spring constant, um, yeah, so to turn this into a spring constant, uh, let's see, solving for this, I get kT LP squared over L to the fourth. The Young's modulus corresponding to that would be kT LP squared over L to the third. So just a different, a one, one power of length different. OK? What if I plug that into here? So this is what I'll call a thermal Young's modulus, effectively, taking into account those thermal fluctuations. So literally, it's, it's, it's sort of like an entropic elasticity. It's, I wouldn't call it purely entropic, but it's um, by pulling on it, you're reducing its available fluctuations, uh, and it's responding with a force that increases. So it's, it is a Hookean, there's a Hookean regime with that kind of behavior. If I were to plug that in here, call it an affine thermal modulus, uh, I would get um, a factor of rho. Um, and this thermal mu, call it kT LP squared divided by L cubed. Notice this, this factor of rho is also can be written in terms of the mesh size with uh, uh, squared. So now, What's the relevant length here? Well, the relevant length really should be between cross lengths. Because those are the things that are, if you like, at least in a simplified fashion, those are the real degrees of freedom of my network. Because all the fluctuating modes in between are the things that are actually going to be dynamical, and the system will explore its available you know, range of fluctuations. So um, this here should actually be the between cross links. And naively, that's expected to be of order the mesh size or maybe a little larger, but it's of order the mesh size. So actually, I'll write it this way. 
notice the very large power of the mesh size. Now, it's actually an upper bound because typically this length is going to be larger than that. Um, but you begin to see this actually goes like the concentration to the 5 halves power. So that's one way to see that as I dilute the system, I get a weaker modulus than this would have predicted. Happens to be 5 halves power, and that's if these two lengths are the same. But actually, the way this works um, uh, is a little long to go through in detail, but let me just explain physically what's going on. It already came up in a, in a question, um, entanglement. If you think about the way these filaments interact with each other, um, an individual filament is wandering around. As, as you go down its backbone, it wanders more and more. There's a so-called wandering exponent of 3 halves. And at some point, it's going to start meeting neighbors. Okay. Um, as you concentrate the system, the amount of that wandering goes down because the filament segments naturally get shorter. So if you like, entanglements become less common as you go to high frequency relative to the spacing between filaments. So that means that this length here, if you do it more carefully, actually acquires this cross-link distance um, actually should not um, depend on C, but should actually go um, uh, slightly, let's see, it should be, uh, it should get elongated relative to that at high concentration. Anyway, if you put that in, a more correct picture is actually a funny exponent of 11 fifths. So it's close to quadratic. Okay, now, dot, dot, dot. There's some calculation there, okay? But it at least has that physics that I was mentioning before. As you take the same basic structure of a network and you increase its concentration, sort of concentrating the mesh, the filaments are themselves getting straighter on that scale, so they're actually less likely to cross, uh, interact with each other, including crosslinks. There's some tests of that experimentally. But let's just see how this works. So let me show you. Um, that this actually does account for some experiments. So these are some experiments from, well, a little over a decade ago now, showing uh, two things. Uh, it's from a, a group in Munich, uh, the Bausch group. Um, it's showing, first of all, uh, well, it's, it's plotted in a slightly complicated way. I don't want to go through. But the inset here shows quite nicely that the, um, it, the fact that these data are collapsing is basically an indication that the shear modulus is growing with the 11 fifths power, slightly odd one. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, the result of a, of a calculation you can do a little bit more carefully um, with concentration. Now, the other thing this shows relates to uh, another interesting property I can get from looking at these fluctuations again. So recall also, I calculated this thing I called the average contraction of the filament. That was the, due to these lateral fluctuations, it was how much it contracts on average. Of course, it'll fluctuate about that. And I showed that that varies with the parameters like this, L squared over LP, with a prefactor. Um, I vaguely recall a, a one-sixth there. I may be wrong on that, but you can do that calculation, depending on boundary conditions. Um, now, what are the implications of that? Well, so I argued here that I get a Hookean response, right? And I could estimate that spring constant, or equivalently, stretch modulus. Now, <clears throat> that's fine, except 
I only have so much filament I can pull out. If I really have an inextensible filament, not truly inextensible, the right way to think about it is this. Uh, this thermal stretch modulus is so much smaller than the mechanical one where I pull directly on the elastic structure that uh, for all practical purposes, I basically have this modulus until I pull out these thermal fluctuations and then it goes much more rigid, okay? Now, if that's the extension available to a, to a filament, the amount of extensional strain available on a segment like this between cross-links is going to be that cross-link length, right? So that actually suggests that there's a maximum strain, so this is just meant to indicate the shear strain, a maximum strain which should be this divided by the length, well, delta L divided by L, or in other words, L over LP. And again, we should think of cross-link distance here, LC. Now, what that's basically just observing is that the range of these fluctuations available, certainly in the Hookean linear response regime, is limited. And it's limited by something at least proportional to that. Now, what that suggests is that there's a characteristic strain at which, well, you could either think of it as the maximum strain or it's the strain at which the system becomes highly nonlinear, actually. So we're ultimately getting to this nonlinear response I talked about before. Um, but if it goes like this, and by the way, this is valid in the limit. that um, all these lengths I'm talking about are small compared with the persistence length. So I'm still operating in this semi-flexible regime where the filaments are pretty, uh, pretty straight, even in the presence of thermal fluctuations. Actually, this is perfectly valid when these, when these lengths actually become comparable. But at least the calculation is most naturally valid in that limit. Um, so basically what happens is the kind of thing I've shown you before. On a log-log scale, actually, I'll, I'll do it in terms of strain. Uh, my experimental colleagues insist on calling this a critical strain. I, I find that slightly unfortunate because there's nothing critical about it in the phase transition sense. But it's a characteristic strain, if you prefer, at which the system goes nonlinear. And it has this very simple dependence. Now, that's something that is very easily measured. The experiments on the lower right show that. But just to show you what's, what to expect, if the, again, if this length here is supposed to be comparable to this uh, mesh size, as I did right here, um, well, that step at least, then um, remember the inverse mesh size goes like, well, the, in, the inverse square of the mesh size is basically a measure of concentration. So this factor up here should go like concentration to the minus 1 half. Right, if LC is equal to the mesh size. Now, in fact, it's not quite that strong because of the effect I mentioned. If you concentrate the system by just increasing the density of fibers, they actually, in relative terms, look straighter on that, on that scale. So uh, the more precise, or the, the better estimate is this an exponent of two-fifths, minus two-fifths. The point four shown there. Yes? Uh, 
Yeah, so um, you're not alone. <laughs> it's actually a, um, uh, this I think everyone can agree on. It's some sort of average of spacing between filaments. The nature of cross-linking is itself subtle. Um, and it depends on preparation. So two seemingly different uh, experimental preparations with the same um, uh, actin, for instance, could come up with radically different uh, effective concentrations. It's hard to control experimentally. What these guys did, and one reason this was a nice experiment, is they used a very special cross-linker, myosin, which is actually a molecular motor that some people may be familiar with. It's actually our muscle. Um, this is actually heavy myosin, which is a, the distinction I've forgotten. But um, when myosin is, de uh, when, you, when you don't provide ATP, the fuel for the motor activity, it will actually go into Rigor and crosslink. So what they did is they were actually able to crosslink, sorry, they were able to control the density of that um, more precisely than the unknown residual amounts of cross-linking present uh, from the preparation of a sample with a mix of many different cross-links. Um, and so they're not able to uh, design that in, so to speak, but what they are able to do is uh, infer its cross-linking in terms of the concentration of that in the, in the inset on the upper right, okay? It's a little indirect. Um, one thing is absolutely universally observed, though, is on these kinds of things, there's a rough inverse square concentration dependence of the strain. Uh, that's very well observed. Um, and then whether or not you really believe a distinction between two-fifths and one-half is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. Okay? Um, Okay, so um, that begins to get us to uh, some nonlinear properties. And so let me sketch for you how to do that. And this will just be a little bit of a sketch of how you do the calculations of these fluctuations and all the, uh, all the other single filament properties correctly, okay? Okay, so we had a discussion uh, last time about boundary conditions. Oh yeah, question. I'm going to argue the form of the crossover comes from something else, but you're, you're right to worry about that because um, polydispersity or variations from point to point in the network of various things, including the degree of cross-linking, can certainly uh, affect the, actual, the precise value you measure on the macroscopic scale, which would be some average. That's a, that's a valid thing to, to be slightly concerned about. Um, uh, there's actually something else about this uh, nonlinear behavior which is easier and, and cleaner to understand theoretically. Not so much the onset, but the high strain regime, okay? So I'll focus on that, but you're, the, the point well taken. Uh, you know, you could also look at it right here. Uh, this, if this is a cross-link length, it should actually be some sort of average, right? And averaging something that might have some spread with this high power could easily shift the coefficient here. True. Okay, so how to do this? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose particularly simple boundary conditions where the two ends of a filament are fixed, but freely hinged. So I won't fix the angles here. Oh, in spite of the fact that it sort of looks like they're horizontal. Here, how's that? Definitely not horizontal. Okay, so what I can do is I can characterize this by some u of x. Now, ultimately, you would do dynamics with u of x and t, and it's not that much harder than doing the static calculation. You just have to figure out what the relevant relaxation of the different modes is. Um, 
And so what I'll do is I'll just expand in a bunch of um, Fourier modes. Now, with my fixed n boundary conditions, the natural one is sine, uh, with a maybe less than natural uh, choice for the q modes. Um, they're just going to be integer 1, 2, 3, et cetera, times pi over L. So in other words, the, the fundamental mode is a half wavelength. Now, once you have this, you can get the bending energy. Uh, well, actually, I don't need approximate signs. This is actually a calculation. Um, I have got 1 over kappa. Uh, I'm supposed to do an integral, remember? It was an integral down the length of, of uh, curvature squared. Uh, so that integral will give me a factor of the length of this segment. The curvature squared will give me so curvature is going to be two derivatives of this. So I'll get q squared uq times a sine again. And a minus sine I don't care about. Square that, and so I get q to the 4. Uh, of course, when I integrate the sine squared, there's actually another factor of 2, so this becomes a 4. OK? Uh, et cetera. Now, one of the first things you learn from this is by doing equipartition on this, identifying 1 half kT per degree of uh, uh, harmonic degree of freedom, you find that u squared on average should be uh, what? Uh, 2. Two kT divided by L kappa q to the four. So now you can start once once I know the expected amplitudes of these modes, I could start calculating various things of interest, including these various fluctuation quantities. Now one of those, I won't go through them all, but one of them which is particularly interesting is this. Uh, Contraction length. So to get that, um, so x is my horizontal coordinate. I claim that's what I should integrate. So what is it? Well, um, so uh, if I have a, slo a local slope here, then obviously the length of this hypotenuse is the sum of the squares of these two things. So in other words, I take the square root of that uh, to get a length. So that's the length contained in this hypotenuse. Um, and I just compare it to the horizontal segment and I get the excess length here, right? And I will, of course, simplify this for a small slope. Note, I'm, I'm starting to use a shorthand. u prime is obviously the derivative of that. So there'll be a q squared that appears here, notice. Uh, and so the first thing I do is to just simplify this. This becomes 1 half uh, the integral dx uh, Q squared, UQ squared. So I hang on, I'm no longer doing an integral, I'm doing a sum. Just like I did here, uh, what I do is I integrate that over the segment. I get the length, L. Um, and I guess there's an additional factor of 2 again. Um, and a summation. Uh, 
Now, if that is the length, then imagine what happens. So to, to, to put a filament under tension, what happens? Well, it contracts. But if it contracts against tension, it does work, right? And so what I should do is I should multiply this by the tension applied to get an energetic contribution in addition to this. So if you allow me to jump ahead slightly, what I'm saying is I add a term like this multiplied by tension to what I have above. Tension I'll call tau. So call this the stretching energy. It's going to be tau delta L. Um, and all that means is I've got, it, I've got this sum here gets more complicated by simply adding this term right down here together with the factor of tension. So in other words, I can get, I can get the mode spectrum actually under tension. Okay? Skipping a step, but I think you see where I'm going with this. Uh, so I've basically added the effect of that. And so now um, I have the way to calculate the transverse displacements, their amplitudes, in the presence of bending rigidity and applied tension, provided everything remains more or less horizontal. I also have this extension, sorry, the degree of contraction. I could calculate that using that spectrum right there. And I would then have the contraction in the presence of force. Now, of course, what that, that tension is doing is stretching it out and decreasing that contraction. OK, you see that? So let me put this all together. Uh, and, you know, there's going to be lots of delta L's. I've used a couple already, but um, OK. So um, to go back to the calculation of the contraction, I take this Q squared and multiply it by UQ squared. There's this, fa there's this term here with factors of Q in the denominator. So what I get is that, summing up over all the modes. Um, in the absence of tension, what I get is the result that I used before. That's the sort of free contraction of ends due to pure thermal fluctuations. But now I get something as a function of tension. And this actually can be solved in closed form so that um, I'll call, I'll put a subscript 0 on this to be the result with 0 tension. That's the thing I said, uh, so that becomes, uh, just a sum over uh, kappa q squared. I've got my mode spectrum here. That's easy to do. It's an infinite series. Um, and uh, you can sort of see what's going to happen there. Um, let's actually evaluate it. It's kt divided by kappa. So that's inverse of uh, uh, LP. Um, Q squared here, I'll plug in those Qs. You might recognize that kind of a sum. Actually, it's uh, pi squared over 6. So I cancel that pi squared, and I get a, a, a 6. But notice uh, this is just um, 
L squared over LP, actually a factor of six. Okay? Now, the slightly more interesting thing, though, is to look at the degree of extension in the presence of tension. Okay, so I'll define it that way. I'll write it that way. What I mean is this. So as I said, I can calculate the contraction in the presence of both bending resistance and tension. Um, I can now calculate the, it's the, actually the reduction, if you like, in the extension. Um, uh, due to, um, yeah, so this would actually be the um, amount that the extension is reduced from the uh, non-tension um, result. The point is, I'm getting a force extension relation. I'm finding out how much the extension varies with tension, OK? And um, there's actually, at this point, a fairly simple scaling argument to get uh, a result that's interesting. So let me actually just subtract these two factors where I use this expression without and with the tau here. Okay, so um, basically, uh, obviously, if I uh, subtract this ratio from the one without tau, I could combine denominators, you know, go through a, uh, an argument like that. Um, and uh, I would then, yeah, so there's a, uh, actually a missing factor of phi here, I believe. So in other words, notice what I have. I've got linear response. I have extension is linear in, uh, this is not volume fraction. Sorry, I'm reusing a symbol. It's a dimensionless measure of tension. It's the tension uh, basically relative to this term right here for the fundamental mode. You might actually recognize bending resistance divided by the square of the length. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone heard of Euler buckling? If you take an elastic rod and you, and you load it axially under compression, it'll buckle at a force threshold, which is bending re resistance pi squared over L squared. So it's actually the, the Euler buckling threshold. So I'm measuring the tension in terms of that. OK, anyway, what happens? Uh, this is uh, taking me a little bit longer than I, I wanted. Um, the point is that uh, this tension basically tells me the value of n, the number of modes, that uh, at, at the 
it gives me a number, a mode number at which the bending and the tension terms here are just balanced. That's the physical way to see it. Notice that the long wavelength modes where Q is small will be dominated by tension. That's basically telling me physically that as I apply tension, the long wavelength modes get straightened out. The short bending modes, which are of small amplitude, but they're still entirely controlled by this term. So as Q gets large, this term dominates that. So the way to think about this is that all the long wavelength modes below a certain characteristic mode number are frozen out. The rod is effectively straight. And what I'm left with is, a, is the remaining few high spatial frequency modes. And so what I get is actually a tension as a function of extension. that looks like this. Linear response followed by a divergence if I don't allow any extension. So this is still an inextensible chain so far. Uh, I know the maximum, the asymptote here, it occurs at the um, relaxed, sorry, the, the tension-free contraction. That's all the available extension I have to pull out. Um, and this literally diverges up to infinity, well, until I reach the point where I start to stretch the backbone of the polymer, OK? Now, it happens to diverge in an interesting way. as the inverse square of the remaining length available. OK, so if I just take this, if I'm up here on this curve somewhere, and I look at just the remaining extension available, then um, it actually, the tension diverges qu inverse quadratically with that. Now, this is something some of you may have seen. Uh, this is the kind of thing that is observed with DNA a lot. When, when people do experiments pulling on DNA, um, particularly it was a lot of experiments on that going back um, you know, three decades ago especially. Um, and uh, this kind of inverse quadratic dependence like this was uh, actually something that um, Marco, uh, John Marco and Eric Sigia calculated for DNA. Um, once the, but the DNA limit, I should say, which is relevant, is chain lengths which are much larger than the persistence length. But what happens when you pull on them is that in the high tension regime, both the, what I would call a semi-flexible limit, where this kind of analysis is valid, L less than LP, and the limit uh, for which those DNA experiments uh, are in the, the persistence length small compared with the length, they basically observe the same dependence. And so this kind of thing is also observed in a variety of experiments. And then I think we'll take a five minute break. Um, so I'll just show those experiments. Uh, again, uh, the, in, the, in the long chain limit, the calculation is a little different from this, but, but they agree uh, this inverse quadratic dependence I mentioned. Um, it's actually a closed form solution, a little weird, but, but a closed form solution you can get uh, for the actual extension as a function of tension, not the reverse. Uh, you'd have to numerically invert that expression. The log log plot uh, is shown on the lower right linear regime and diverging extension. Uh, it's not diverging at one just because I'm normalizing it in a slightly different way, but it will actually diverge. Um, uh, actually, this, this affine limit here, I should point out, uh, also connects up with one of the other speakers here. Uh, uh, at a collaboration a few years ago, it was Tom Lubinsky looking at this in connection with those experiments I mentioned 
uh, uh, Paul Janme. Um, but uh, it's, the basis of it is just this argument I went through to get the contraction. Do all the mode analysis properly. There's something I was not quite doing correctly over here, and so at some point there might be a factor of two somewhere. This is only one of the two polarization modes. You have to take into account the other one. And that will at some point absorb effectively this, it'll change a factor of four somewhere to a factor of two. Um, so there'll be um, more contraction by a factor of two for having two different uh, polarization modes for, for fluctuation. Um, and so here's what's interesting about this result. If the um, tension is going like the inverse square of the extension, that would suggest that the stress is going like the inverse, I'll write it this way, square of the strain, right? Because this extension is going to come from straining my sample. If that's the stress as a function of strain, notice what happens if I take its derivative. This is the tangent modulus. I know I'm reusing another symbol k. Uh, d sigma d gamma. If the stress is like that, the derivative, of course, goes like delta gamma to the minus 3, which is also stress to the 3 halves power. OK? So if I were to plot this, uh, not tension versus extension, but stiffness versus stress, I'd get a 3 halves power. And that's what the experiments show. So this is um, uh, the, the, the first experiments along these lines were actually uh, in collaboration with Dave Waits years ago. Margaret Gardell uh, did these experiments. This is on actin. It's showing samples with different concentrations. And they're actually amusingly, it, this is actually an interesting point, they seem to sort of all kind of converge, not quite, but, but they at least uh, sort of overlap uh, at high concentration. Um, and this exhibits uh, 3 halves um, scaling. It's observed routinely in other systems now. So these are neurofilaments. Uh, this is a little bit more impressive for the range involved. These are three decades here. Uh, neurofilaments happen to be almost, well, essentially one of the most ideal semi-flexible polymers uh, to study. Uh, they happen to be just in a sweet spot from the sort of um, polymer physics point of view. Um, and um, there's, uh, well, there's another comparison I'll show with these experiments, but I think let's maybe take a pause, OK? Um, I'll, I'll show some more uh, agreement with experiments here. So five minutes? Sure. And still questions if you want. Uh, this all is so far. I'm, I'm getting, I, I, okay, 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 I, okay, I definitely okay. want to point, well, next week is going to be non-affine, okay, effectively. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, can you repeat again the analysis of like low frequency modes? And yeah. So, um, back over to here. This part OK? Yes. So um, at high spatial frequency, this dominates that. So what that means is whatever controls the conformation of a, of a polymer on a really short scale, it's bending dominated. With tension, however, on the long scales, it becomes tension dominated. And the effect of that is that, um, crudely speaking, um, all the long wavelength contributions to that contraction I showed before are shut off. So I basically take this calculation here, and rather than calculating all the modes from n equal 1 up to infinity, I only calculate above some characteristic n that depends on tension. And that has the effect of greatly reducing uh, this extension relative to that, i.e., 
giving rise to this. Uh, it's a slightly more involved thing to see where the square comes from, but it's pretty easy. All you do is you, you take this picture right here and you say, uh, let's see. Uh, no, let's look at this one. So if you buy my argument that the tension-dominated modes have no more extension available, mm -hmm. then what you do is you take this series and you just, so that's a series that looks like this as a function of n, right? And you say, oh, well, below a certain amount, they're all saturated, and I only get that contribution. So you lose all this. Um, and um, because there's a quadratic relationship between the length scale and the force, uh, there winds up being a, so this characteristic n goes like the square root of the tension. And uh, that's how this goes like the square root of that. Make any uh, calculations for lateral uh, fluctuations? Well, these are th these are lateral. Um, you mean it's, uh, flexural vibrations, right? I, I mean, I think you're doing this averages from this flexion, right? Uh, yeah, but it, but but fundamentally, that contraction is all coming from the lateral. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I'm asking you. You can do it all oh, that. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. By the way, you can do this all dynamically. So um, what happens is. Uh, uh, the dynamical version of this is uh, something like this, u, q, t, u, q, zero, uh, actually minus q, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's this times e to the minus uh, t over a q-dependent relaxation rate. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not to be confused with tension. Um, that relaxation rate uh, inverse tau q goes like q to the 4. It's a very strongly dependent dynamics. The other thing is, where, where is the, the, the dissipation? I mean, I believe the dissipation yeah. occurs more when there's the radius of curvature varies the most. Ah, OK. So I think you're thinking about internal dissipation. Yeah. Internal um, in, in this, uh, at this level of description, there's none of that. It's oh, all yeah, just an elastic body. The dissipation is assumed to be the transverse motion of this through a viscous solvent. Okay. That's yeah, that's what gives this. So this winds up depending on viscosity. And you're assuming that the, the beam is uh, uh, symmetrical, right? Yeah. Like a, yeah. Simple Euler elastica. Mm -hmm. Because it, it could be like a slightly flatter and then the, the, it would vibrate more. Right. So for instance, the I'd, I would really need to worry about torsion at that point, and I would have. Uh, I would have uh, maybe different dynamics or different different fluctuations actually in the two polarization states. This is really nice. I have one more question. A slip of paper. We just played this. Uh -huh. It's really nice. It's so many applications. Right? Yeah. It's it's yeah. very old. Yeah. So it's. Uh, I mean the Euler. Uh, yeah. The oil, uh, so there there are experiments that directly see um, Euler buckling in living cells, which is kind of cool. Uh, muscle cells do this. As the actin cortex contracts, mm -hmm. the microtubules in it will undergo an oscillatory. Oh, the yeah, they'll go undergo an oscillatory buckling. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, results on that were suggesting that it was uh, transverse motor activity pulling it transverse. But no, no, it, it's it's a it's like a periodic wave. Mm -hmm. And what it is is it's it's actually a problem out of Landau Lifshitz. Uh, Landau and Lifshitz work out the problem. Uh, someone pointed this out to me. I, didn't, I confess I hadn't read Landau and Lifshitz to find this myself. But Landau and Lifshitz work out the problem of Euler buckling, not, on a, not a free Euler buckling alone, but Euler buckling in the presence of an elastic medium. Mm, oh, inside the it, yeah, and so what happens is rather than the fundamental mode of, mode of buckling, it buckles at a, at, a wa at a particular wavelength at a much higher force threshold than the fundamental mode would have buckled. It's actually kind of cool. Uh, it's in uh, Landau and Lifshitz's uh, uh, theory of elasticity, yeah. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teoria uprugusti. Yeah. 
in Russian, I guess. Oh, okay. I lose the point when you say that the 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 the, the mode has this shape because when I when t is equal to zero, you need yeah. To so re, you need to uh, recover the 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 previous one. The previous one. Yeah. That, the previous one has this. Is, uh, no, it's, it's actually slightly uh, better deriv derivation than that. Where this came from was from this Q4. If I add another term, which is tau Q squared U Q squared, they really are added together. And so then I can just add them. Oh, yeah. and, and the, the second one is why you say that uh, uh, sigma is uh, oh. similar to... So tension gives the stress, yeah. right? Because it's forced per unit area. Extension comes from strain. So that's why this result here suggests that stress goes like that. Ah, yeah. Okay. Here. Mm -hmm. Start again. OK. Uh, so there's a couple loose ends um, that I, I want to fill in because I think they're kind of interesting. Um, one more thing along these lines uh, that I want to look at is uh, the following. So I have a expression which is probably gone now, yeah, for the modulus. OK, that was one way of writing that expression I had for the modulus. So this is now using that thermally fluctuating uh, force extension in the linear regime. So by the way, physically, it's using this Hookean regime here. Um, one thing that, that is worth noting, by the way, is remember, LP is not a parameter. It's something that comes from thermal fluctuations and the mechanics of the rod. So a better way to write this, actually, in some sense, is uh, kappa squared over kT. And that's a little weird, because we're used to thinking about entropic elasticity as an, entropic, as an, as an elasticity proportional to kT, right? These systems are weird. There's actually an inverse kT dependence. Now, of course, that doesn't mean at zero temperature it's infinite. That means at zero temperature, it's just the mechanical response, OK? So it will ultimately cross over to the mechanical. But just before I look at that, um, let me point out another thing. So I've argued, and I um, actually showed you data. I'll just put it up. I don't think we need to change the lights. Chalk interferes with my mouse the hazards of teaching, I guess. 
Okay, so for instance, that or that. Um, so one of the things that's quite natural to observe here is the uh, characteristic st stress at which the systems go nonlinear. It's pretty reproducible, by the way. That's a series of different sam multiple different samples and different concentrations rescaled by the appropriate uh, horizontal axes just to show that it's all really the same underlying functional form. Um, so I argued that there was a characteristic strain which was proportional to this, right? The ratio of the cross link distance to the persistence length in the limit that it's assumed the persistence length is, is the largest of those. So this characteristic strain is typically 10%, 20%, something like that, maybe five. Um, now, the critical strain, this, this strain squared times the modulus would give me the stress, the corresponding stress, right? No, sorry. This times the modulus would give me the stress. Square would give me energy. Um, so uh, that corresponds to a critical uh, or characteristic stress uh, where basically that factor of LC eliminates one of the ones over there, and this factor of LP eliminates one of the ones there. And I get, I'll still write it this way. Like that. Um, by the way, this also has an interesting interpretation. Um, this combination is also just the bending modulus. And again, bending modulus divided by the squared length of a polymer is that uh, Euler buckling force threshold. So notice this is like saying um, 1 over c squared gives me the length per volume. I multiply that by the characteristic force due to Euler buckling, and I get this characteristic stress. Um, so now, here's one of the complications that has arisen in interpreting some of these experiments. And I already mentioned it in connection with the experiments I showed before. I said that it's sometimes difficult to get or control sometimes even just measure that cross-link distance. So one of the things you can do is you can look at a combination of these me directly measurable quantities in such a way that this drops out. That's a useful thing to do. Take the least well-characterized thing and try to remove it from the, from the problem. And so notice that apart from, if it weren't for this factor of kappa here and the C squared, if I raise this uh, stress to the 3 halves power, it should vary with LC the same way the modulus does. Now, this factor of 1 over uh, C squared, of course, is rho. So if I take this expression and raise it uh, to the 3 halves power, and here's my factor of rho here. I should get the shear modulus apart from a factor of the square root of uh, the concentration. So in other words, if I take rho square root times g, then I should get something that should have the same dependence um, as this stress to the 3 halves power. Apart from, so I'm assuming that a couple things are not changing when I do that comparison. KT is the same. In practice, people don't vary the temperature with these experiments because a lot of things in biology don't respond well to changes in temperature. So you tend to have a narrow range of temperatures to do this. You can't really do cry, you know, physics level low temperature experiments, certainly. Um, and I'm assuming that the, uh, uh, well, I'm also assuming we're comparing the same type of filament. So persistence length and temperature don't change. So the point is, if I, if I, if I plot 
um, the square root of concentration times G versus uh, characteristic strain, I should get something insensitive to the cross-link density, that least well characterized experimental parameter. And here's what happens. Uh, these are two different physical systems. It's, it's neurofilaments and bimentin. They're two intermediate filaments. They, of course, have different persistence lengths, so I'm not surprised to see that they're not the same line. But what's shown is a whole bunch of experiments over many different concentrations and multiple experiments even at the same concentration. Um, and you get a three-half slope, uh, not this one. It's just a, another fractional combination uh, between the square root of concentration times the modulus and the uh, characteristic stress. So it again uh, supports the idea that uh, at least for these systems, and intermediate filaments are probably the best interpreted in terms of this affine model, as it, as it turns out, um, the agreement's pretty good. So in just the last uh, couple of minutes, what I'd like to do is show you, oh, no, one last thing. So remember I was looking at the mechanical stretch modulus of a fiber in terms of the Young's modulus and cross-section area. I've also um, talked about a thermal response. And that was, well, it's actually the combination of these factors here without the row. Now, I've been making the assumption that this is the softest mode of deformation. When I apply a, a, a tension to the filament, I'm pulling out these transverse fluctuations, which are all related to this contraction and the fluctuations of the ends. And that's what's giving me this thing. At some point when the tension goes sufficiently high, though, there's no remaining excess length to pull out, and I've got to start pulling on the backbone. And so at some much higher level, I'll have another Hookean response regime up here, OK? Uh, that's actually apparent in those experiments. Didn't point it out at the time, but you might have noticed one set of data here is starting to curve over. By doing a little bit more careful analysis, you can show that that is consistent with the stretch modulus appearing of the, of the filaments. But you can see that it's a couple orders of magnitude higher. OK, so what I, what I want to point out is it's interesting to compare these two things. So notice where they're comparable. So um, what I'll do is I'll write this in a suggestive way. This is kappa LP, that's a combination of KT and one factor of LP, divided by LC cubed. Um, and kappa, remember, scales as the Young's modulus times the radius of the fiber to the fourth power. Notice this dependence right here. Uh, so in other words, this is um, essentially mu mechanical times A squared LP over LC cubed. Now, when is the thermal response going to be relevant? It's when it's softer than this. When the length segments get so small, or when I apply enough tension, but in the linear response at least, when these segments get so small that this is a 
higher modulus than that, then you just go ahead and stretch the polymer backbone. Okay? But where they're comparable is interesting. And so um, this is of order, well, basically by almost definition, this is of order the mechanical response when LC is of order the cube root of A squared LP. Uh, well, actually, yeah, what I'll do is I'll call this a new length. Mechanical thermal transition, okay? It's basically the point at which I'm transitioning from a mechanical response or an elastic response of the fibers to a thermal one. And here's what I find interesting about it. Notice that this length here is not just the geometric mean of the, of the molecular scale and the persistence length. It's a weighted geometric mean in favor of the small scale. This length is much smaller than the persistence length if these two lengths are, differ by orders of magnitude as the numbers I showed you before do. So here's what I find interesting about that. That says that I can go to a semi-flexible polymer and I can look at a polymer segment which is far shorter than the persistence length. And I'm still assured that the very first thing I pull on are the thermal fluctuations, even if they're very small. And only after I exceed a threshold do I start seeing this behavior and maybe an eventual transition to a mechanical response. Okay? So I showed before a bunch of lengths, yet another length that naturally comes out. So, okay, in just the last couple of minutes, let me give a hint at the other missing physics, okay? I've been talking about systems mostly deforming affinely, right? I'll give you a very quick argument to just get us started in that direction, and then this will be basically the subject of the final lectures, including some interesting connections to a mechanical phase transition, uh, vaguely reminiscent of jamming. Um, uh, so if I take that modulus and I plug it into my original expression involving the volume fraction, one power of volume fraction, I get a mechanical response of the network, which is basically hard to observe. It's a little hard to get into that regime. You could do it maybe at high concentration where this length gets small and this modulus is, is, becomes stiffer than that one. I haven't seen convincing examples of those experiments just yet. Um, may or may not be doable. Um, but uh, you remember when I was saying that the naive estimate of the shear modulus of a network was too high, and there were at least two reasons why we should correct it. One's the thermal. This is basically showing that the thermal response, longitudinal response, is much smaller than that previous model suggested. So this could account and basically does a good job of accounting for the observed lower moduli, but it's not the whole story. Um, and it's especially inappropriate, I would say, for um, networks like collagen or systems that have a, that, that are, fibers are so rigid that there's essentially no thermal fluctuations to speak of. So for instance, estimate that quantity for collagen, and I assure you, you'll convince yourself this shouldn't appear. Okay, so um, basically the way a system would deform affinely is to say, again, that every microscopic chunk of the material has a strain identical to the macroscopic strain applied to the whole system. It's not a good assumption for a disordered system. It might be a pretty good assumption. So, for instance, if you take, uh, if you take uh, flexible polymers and you make a gel, um, you find that, um, you know, the error made by not including non-affine effects, basically stuff like this, for a flexible polymer, it's about 20, 30%. It's not huge, okay? So the, the 
affine models, the original rubber elastic models people developed many decades ago now, are you know, most of the story, I would say, with some very interesting physics behind the non-affinity, of course. Um, but I want to argue that these, for these fiber systems, the effect here is qualitative. It changes things by orders of magnitude, or at least can. OK, so um, how to estimate that. So let's, um, yeah. let's look at a different picture. Um, take that lower picture. So um, imagine, what, what I'm trying to sketch there is the following. It's an inhomogeneous disordered system. Those black regions, you should imagine, are somehow more rigid. So rather than shearing, they rotate in a softer matrix. And as they rotate, it's kind of easy to see that I start bending anything else around it, right? So let's take that idea and imagine that the, um, the bending energy of one of those fibers is going to be something like this. Well, um, I take the bending rigidity. Uh, I deform some end. So this delta u is just meant to represent some small local displacement of some point. Uh, and if I divide that by the, I'll, I'll just take the mesh size. Distance between cross links could be done as well. I want to imagine a densely cross-linked system to start with. So I'll take the mesh size. Um, this would estimate uh, the, um, uh, sorry, that would estimate the curvature. Remember, curvature has units of uh, 1 over length. Uh, so uh, if I displace an end, I change an angle by an amount du over xc. I do it over the length xc. That gives me curvature. That's curvature, and then I should square that, right? So that would be the elementary bending energy in one of those segment lengths, OK? And again, this is not the modulus. I have a bunch of these. Uh, in fact, it's actually the uh, bending energy per unit length, right? Because I take the curvature squared times bending rigidity, and I integrate. So if I wanted to estimate the modulus I would get from bending, so call it a bend-dominated modulus, I could take this thing here. Oh, uh, hang on. One more step. Excuse me. Um, how do I turn this into the strain? Well, the displacements naively the relative displacements of the ends will depend on their length uh, and the amount that they're displaced. So in fact, one power delta u over c should be an approximate measure of strain. Do you agree with me on that? Uh, again, I'm basically saying strain is essentially delta u over c. Um, strain's dimensionless, right? It's a measure of, of deformation. OK. So um, now, if that's the energy per unit length in terms of uh, strain, two derivatives with respect to strain gives me the modulus. So in other words, I can basically read off the modulus from this kappa, this factor of 1 over c squared, if I multiply by the line density that factor of rho, because this was all per unit length. So that suggests that the modulus should be kappa 1 over c squared times rho, rho being length per volume. And it's, it's the second derivative of energy per volume with respect to strain that gives me the modulus. That's one way to get the modulus. This is also a factor of density. So notice this goes like kappa phi squared. That also could account for these much lower moduli. And in many cases, it probably is the main reason. 
um, a lot of experimental effort uh, has actually gone into trying to disentangle these two mechanisms, so to speak, and clearly identify one over the other. Uh, the kinds of experiments I showed you before go some way to that. These kinds of experiments, uh, you can't understand that behavior from the point of view of, of this, it turns out. Um, so this clearly points to a thermal mechanism, I would say. But there's other experiments that clearly um, point in this direction. Um, and so, um, well, I'll start fleshing that out next time and connect it up with various things like the Maxwell counting of constraints, isostatic conditions, uh, vague connections to jamming. It's not quite the same, but it, but it bears some resemblance. It's a mechanical zero temperature phase transition. Um, I want to argue that we need to understand that as a function of strain and not as a function of concentration. Um, and the other thing I hope to have time to do is talk about adding thermal effects back into that. So one of the things rarely looked at in like the jamming contacts partic in particular is thermal effects. It's quite interesting when you add that in. Uh, and anyway, so that's just a heads up on things we'll start looking at next week. There is this interesting interplay between the mechanical and therm thermal response. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering how, how this results depends on temperature. Because, you know, all, I mean, I guess that uh, the interval of temperature in which those things works uh, in, uh, in a body is not that huge. Then uh, how does, how does yeah, it depend? Yeah, so I would love to, to have the ability to, well, for instance, this counterintuitive feature right here that somehow naively an, entro an entropic-like origin of a modulus winds up going like inverse KT is weird. Um, the problem is if you vary temperature with those proteins that are making up the assemblies of the fibers, they're typically stable in a narrow temperature range anyway. So not only would you possibly change the mechanical bending rigidity, um, you might actually, uh, they might dissolve, right? They might, they might break up. Yes. So in practice, um, uh, room temperature tends to be at the low end and body temperature at the upper end. And, you know, that's a decade. <laughs> sorry, I mean, this is a factor of 10. Uh, not a factor, eight, eight, 10 degrees, sorry, what am I saying? Um, and out of, you know, on the absolute temperature scale, that's negligible. So sadly, temperature is not really an accessible variable. If we were to, let's say, keep uh, annealing between these two temperatures, like you said, uh, the room versus the body, or T up and T down, would you reach uh, different configurations uh, of, the, of the network or, and, you know, oh. correspond to different minima on the landscape? Itai, if you prepare collagen samples at different temperature, what do you, uh, I, I'm almost sure you'll get different st structure. I know from Gaisia uh, Kundrink, my, my colleague in the Netherlands, that I've forgotten the details, but when they prepare collagen at body temperature versus room temperature, they get thicker bundles in one case, and I've forgotten which is which. But uh, let's suppose I start with a configuration, and I heat it up and then anneal uh, mm -hmm. back to a low temperature, would it, you know, reach the, the network? Would it reach a different configuration, or? Hmm. I don't have a good. The, the yeah, I, I, likely, <laughs> but but I think you'll probably wind up doing other things too. So one of the things people worry about experimentally a fair amount are so-called pre-stresses. So when you prepare these samples, what people tend to try and do is polymerize the sample in the rheometer. Because if you flow these samples, because they're relatively soft, you'll frequently either align them or break up the filaments. So they'll typically prepare the sample, they'll, they'll polymerize it in the actual experimental chamber, rheometer in many cases. Um, and nevertheless, 
there's a lot of evidence that points in the direction of uh, that sample, even though it's being polymerized without further deformation, it actually polymerizes with a lot of built-in stress. Okay. You might be able, through annealing, to get rid of that, but that's an area that people haven't really sorted out yet. It's just the folklore in the business is you prepare these samples, and they tend to have unexpectedly large normal stresses, they're called. I see. Uh, basically trying to bring the plates together or move them apart. It's because uh, it's over-constrained, so there's like some... In, in the cases where they're actually polymerizing two components, so for instance, some ongoing experiments in a collaboration with the Kundrink group right now is collagen plus hyaluronic acid. And in that case, the two, uh, two species polymerize at different rates. And I can certainly imagine that the evolution of one of those networks winds up stressing the other. I don't know. I, I, that's, a, that's a little mysterious area. Looks like Itai has something to say about it. No, I, I have a different question. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, you know, in many ways, this looks like the shear thickening transition. So if instead of d, gamma, d sigma by d gamma, it'd be Volume d sigma by d gamma dot, um, then shear thickening oh. also has a stress onset where, like in suspensions, when particles start to touch each other, when you have a high enough stress so the particles start to touch each other and create contact networks that become rigid, that's when you start getting the thickening. And then the slope of the thickening depends on the volume fraction because you, you can get things like discontinuous versus continuous thickening mm -hmm. depending on. So I, I'm trying to map this on. So what's the onset stress for that? Neat, for well, that? so the interesting thing is, um, so in a, in a particulate system, typically the strains and strain rates involved wind up depending on the geometry and therefore the particle size. You don't have a lot of it. And the volume fractions don't vary a lot, right? right. Here, the, uh, this parameter right here can vary by up to about an order of magnitude would be on the high side, but quite a bit. Um, and so you can actually have samples that have a pretty wide range of, of uh, strains and stresses at the onset of nonlinearity. Right, but, but the same mechanism Seems, I mean, like when you have the knee, what's what's changing between oh, the mechanism here versus that one? Well, the claim is it's it's just getting to this regime right here, right. where this goes nonlinear. And and what's but what is turning on when it's going nonlinear? But the you've, taut you've, the taut part is 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 that not the the TM right or the MT? Like what? Well, so forget about that part for now. That that's. Right. Typically hard to get to experimentally even. Um, but so this is just linear response. It's just a harmonic linear elastic material. Yeah, and there you're pulling Goes out the thermal. So um, at least I would say, well, so I would say the, what's, what's happening is that uh, the, the, the threshold is basically determined by where this tension first becomes comparable to the lowest mode of this term. Uh huh. And so that's, that depends on the architecture. Uh, so I'm saying you can vary it with, a, with, a, with at least in principle, a simple architectural parameter. Right. I guess it's just for a single fiber. Yeah, this is a single fiber picture, too. The only, the only uh, multi-particle aspect, so to speak, is just the connections between them. Yeah, yeah which, of course, is encoded by this length. Yeah, I don't think the mechanisms are the same. There's some similarity. No, 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 no. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. By the architecture of the... Well, you know, so here the slope won't vary at all. Right. That's, the, that's at least the claim. And it is at least reassuring from the point of view of that model that that a wide range of systems with widely different persistence lengths. But are what if you had, uh, you know, fibrils that had a, you know, some super architecture to them? You could imagine. Anyway, they wouldn't be thermal, but okay. Yeah, and and so typically what happens in those systems is, uh, well, actually, so uh, 
this is not totally general, but it's, a, it's an observation. Um, uh, if you do this, I don't happen to have the data with me, but uh, if you do the same kind of thing with collagen, what you typically find is the slope goes to one. Now, we think we understand that by a different mechanism, but it certainly not, wouldn't lie on this. In spite of that early experiment of Paul Janmes that was saying, oh, they all look the same. Well, no, if you look in detail, the thermal and the athermal systems are different. More questions? So let's thank Professor McIntosh again. Uh, we have cough break now, and we'll come back on Monday. Have a very nice weekend.